The following program is made possible with support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Heather Berlin. And I'm Faith Saley. We're going to be reviewing current movies, TV shows, and sometimes checking out a blast from the past, but from the scientific point of view. Today, we're going to take a look at mental illness and the movies. We're going to start out with Kristen Wiig's new film, Welcome to Me. In Welcome to Me, a woman with borderline personality disorder goes off her medication, wins the lottery, and then buys herself a talk show. If you're calling to report a winning, just say, I'm a winner at any time. I'm a winner at any time. You must be the big winner. I am rich. Me too. I want a talk show with me as the host. You want to talk about current events? No. Mm, what kind of stuff do you want to talk about? Me. Ooh. How much will that cost? $15 million. Oh, and I want to come in on a swan boat. Heather, what did you think of this movie? You know, I, I, didn't, fi I didn't find it as funny as I did kind of sad because I work with people with borderline personality disorder and kind of know what they're struggling with. And so I guess for me, I didn't see so much of the humor in it as much as the kind of a, a bit of tragedy in it. We all think of Kristen Wiig as being v very funny, and she is. Mm -hmm. But you're, as an audience, you're not sure how much you're supposed to laugh because she clearly is disordered. It was very difficult to root for her. That's why I found this movie very, very challenging because mm -hmm. um, she's clearly our, we have no other protagonist, and, and yet there doesn't seem to be like much of a learning arc for her. So having worked with borderline personality disorder patients, mm -hmm. is the fact that at the end of the movie things kind of go stay the same there's not this real metanoia for her you know there's not this real big epiphany is that kind of sadly what life is like so the the the, the hard thing about the personality disorders is that because they're a personality disorder they're pretty stable throughout a lifetime they're very difficult to treat you know it's like how do you change a person's complete personality you don't you help them modulate it and modify, let's say, the emotional instability, but there's no, you know, like cure for borderline personality disorder. You can just help them manage their symptoms. So, you know, watching this film, I knew there was never going to be this point at which, you know, she had an epiphany or she's cured. Um, but, you know, you did see certain glimpses of her understanding. So in order to treat a person with borderline personality disorder, you put people on meds, right? And, yeah. and in the movie, Kristen Wiig's character goes off her meds. Um, it seems like things would go better if she stayed on them. Why do these patients go off of their medication? Well, well for borderline personality disorder, actually the first line treatment is not medication. It's, it's really therapy. It's something called dialectic behavioral therapy or also cognitive behavioral therapy um, because they really have to retrain their brains how to modulate their emotions and their, their impulses. Um, but usually you have that first line treatment in conjunction with medication to help you know, kind of dampen some of the symptoms, but there's no magic cure and there's no magic drug. So they tend to either be on sort of mood stabilizers or even antipsychotic drugs. Now, she went off her medication, um, which is never a good idea because then the symptoms obviously just get, get worse again. But a lot of patients do this. It's very hard for them to stick to the medication because once they start feeling, oh, I'm feeling better, why do I need to be on this drug? You know, and then they end up going off. And there's also stigma attached to being on drugs. You know, people think, I don't need a drug to modify my behavior. And so a lot of them are very resistant, and it's not uncommon for people to go off meds. So have you treated people with, with BPD? I've, so I've done research with people with borderline personality disorder, but I'm looking at what's going on in their brain. That's sort of what I've been focused on. You know, how does their brain work and how can we then treat them um, by understanding the neural basis of the disorder. And do we understand it? What is going on in the brain of someone like Kristen Wiig's character? Yeah, we're starting to understand it. And part of it is 
the brake system in the brain, the prefrontal cortex, is not really functioning that well. And the emotional parts of the brain, like the amygdala, are overactive. So you have this extreme emotion sort of bursting out all over the place. And the part of the brain that is meant to modulate these emotions is not really doing a very good job. And the connectivity between the sort of accelerator and the brake is not um, intact. So you have the combination of these things makes it very difficult for them to control their emotions and modify their behavior and act in socially appropriate ways. Her character, Alice, um, obviously has a mental illness, but her desire to review her life, in this case on her own talk show, um, but the desire to review one's life seems like a normal kind of desire. So what makes her fall into the range of someone with with uh, borderline personality disorder? So most of us look back on our lives and think about you know events that have happened to us, but her, number one, wanting to put it on display. You know, everyone, look at me, this is my life, you all need to see in this. In a swan boat. In yes. a swan boat, you know, <laughs> very extravagantly, like, look at me, look at me. Um, and the things that she happened to choose, you know, like the fact that, for example, that a friend like stole makeup out of her bag or something was like this huge event in her life, whereas that might have happened to one of us and you would have forgotten about it. It wouldn't have been something you would put in to your life review story, right? So it kind of gave you insight of how she looks at her life and the things that really stand out to her. And that's classic borderline, you know, a small slight and they hugely exaggerate it. Um, and it was really focused on the relationships in her lives, like the people who wronged her and she wanted the world to see. And so it was the way in which she did it and just how self-absorbed it was, how narcissistic the whole thing was. So most people, if you want a million dollars, I don't know if the first thing you'd want to do is, you know, put a review of your life on TV. I mean, maybe it is. I don't know. You are writing a book. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But... <laughs> But, you know, it's, it's about the, to the extreme in which it happens. And we all have, you know, certain traits that could be, if they were in the extreme, be considered a certain psychiatric illness. It's all about, you know, the um, severity of it, basically. And so she has this driving need to be on television. Um, kind of a lot of people have that. Is this a new thing in the world? Yeah, I mean, why would you want to be on television? I have no idea. <laughs> I, I don't either. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's not. I think, you know, if you if you take a step back and look at it from an evolutionary perspective that having high status in your social group meant it would increase your chances to survive. And so people talking about you, you know, being the one that's sort of popular, so to speak, is was thing that people strove to have. And now this sort of television is like a quick way to get there. You assume people are on TV because they're doing something good, because they're talented, people are talking but about them. But we know that's not true. We know that plenty of people with nothing to offer have their own TV shows. Yes, and but we, as, and I mean the Kardashians maybe, you know, what, what is their talent, what do they do? But the Instagramming, fact Heather. that they give, but the fact that they're on a platform it makes you assume there must be something about them that's special, that's right. important. And also, it's even if people are known for something, you know, if they're infamous, you know, for doing something that's that's really not that great, it's still people know who I am. I'm an entity. I have I, meaning. I matter. I matter. Because exactly. Exactly. And so a lot of times, you know, it can do with low self-esteem and wanting to be, just wanting to be heard, wanting to be known. And, and I matter, even if it's for doing a bad thing. One thing that was very telling that Bob said, he said, all my life I've had more money than I could spend, and it didn't make me happy. She talked on the telephone with her husband, then she vanished, and no one has seen Kathleen Durst since. Durst was wanted for murder in Texas. He was a suspect for murders in Los Angeles and Westchester County, New York. Belongs to one of the richest families in New York City. Might be a little eccentric. I think Bob is very smart. I mean, he's managed to get away with three murders. Not tell the whole truth. Nobody tells the whole truth. If Bob Durst is guilty of these murders, I wonder <laughs> what is the current clinical designation of someone who acts like this? So. Again, I'd be very, you know, cautious to make a diagnosis of someone by just seeing a documentary. You obviously, when we make a diagnosis, we do a lot of tests and questions and so forth. But if I was going to sit there, you know, from my armchair, I mean, he is definitely somebody who has what we call antisocial personality disorder. 
uh, also known as like a psychopath. Yeah, that would be his. He's role. a psychopath. Yeah, I would say. It, <laughs> if, if he, if for some reason he didn't murder these three people, mm -hmm. uh, from watching him in this documentary, does he? Do you still think he's a psych, he's a psychopath? Um, is, I think is it the that, murder that makes him? So? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, so let's say he didn't murder these people. Yeah. Um, then what you want to do is you want to look at the history of a person. What kind of things did he do? So to be diagnosed as a, as a person who's, it's called antisocial personality disorder, you had to have had what's called um, conduct disorder as a child. That means you had to have been doing things that were, you know, impulsive, aggressive, breaking laws, you know, not caring about the rules, not really caring about other people's feelings. Um, so it's not just about murder. So you have to see a long history because it's a personality disorder which is pervasive, it lasts for a lifetime, so it has to have started in childhood and continue on. So we'd really want to look at what his behaviors are like in his everyday life outside of the murders themselves. Um, if he in fact did these murders, then it's the classic kind of cold psychopath killer who has kind of no empathy, has no feelings for other people, um, just does things that will be to his advantage. But, I mean, even if he didn't kill them, I definitely think he might be, have something called Asperger's, which is a kind of a disorder where people are a bit socially awkward and have trouble kind of relating to other people. Um, and he even claimed that for one of his cases that he, his lawyer said that he had Asperger's. So that could be another diagnosis. Robert Durst also has this kind of winsome side, right? Mm -hmm. And so Jarecki and he forged this strange relationship. Jarecki feels very sympathetic. We learn Robert Durst saw his mother commit suicide. Now, that's horrible. That's mm -hmm. horrific. Mm -hmm. But other boys lose their mothers. Why does one boy turn into a psychopath? Yeah, you know, with this backstory. So, you know, there everybody has some kind of a, something traumatic happens to them at some point in their life, usually. Maybe not as severe as watching your mother kill yourself, but why do some people turn out to be murderers? And there's something, there's a, a theory that there are people who, it's called adaptive um, psychopathy, or where people are born with this certain sort of predisposition to... Like a trigger? Or not even a trigger, but are have the, there, well, there's something called a stress diathesis model where you have this sort of vulnerability or predisposition towards becoming, let's say in this case, a psychopath or, and then something really traumatic happens that, yeah, in a sense, a trigger that sets it off, but you already had a, a vulnerability, a predisposition uh, to develop that. So I don't know that the cause of what happened later in his life and his behaviors was the fact that he saw his mother kill herself, but it certainly, you know, didn't help. But whether he would have not become a murderer if that didn't happen, you know, we can't really tell. We can't really say. And there's something also called acquired um, psychopathy where people can get a brain lesion later in life and then become and display all these same characteristics as a psychopath. So, you know, you can be born with it. It could be an environmental trigger. It can be um, something physically just happens to your brain. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that makes for fascinating questions about l legality, right? Yes, Some, yeah. Something happens to your brain and it's not really your fault, but then you become a killer? I mean, it's... Yeah, there's a famous case where a person around in his 40s started developing pedophilia, um, and they were going to lock him up, and he started getting headaches, and they did an MRI and found a big tumor in his prefrontal cortex. They removed the tumor, all the pedophilia symptoms went away. He was allowed to return home where he had a young stepdaughter. A year later, the symptoms came back and sure enough, the tumor had grown back. And so it really does get into this question about, you know, what's the legality? How much do we punish these people if it is just their brain? But, you know, even you can point to some difference and everybody has some slight variation in their brain and that doesn't really give them a reason to not be responsible for their actions. All right, let's move on to a fictional character notoriously devoid of empathy. The American Film Institute voted Hannibal Lecter as the number one movie villain. <sighs> Created by novelist Thomas Harris, Lecter first appears in the novel Red Dragon, but it was Sir Anthony Hopkins' portrayal in Silence of the Lambs that made Hannibal Lecter a cultural icon. In his first three films, Thomas Harris was very clear that Hannibal Lecter did not fit into any kind of neat psychological profile, um, which sounds all nice and good and easy to understand, but don't we all s somehow fit into some psychological profile? 
Yeah, we all, I mean, so not everybody has a psychiatric disorder, but we all have different personality traits, different characteristics. We're all, you know, it's like a thumbprint. You know, we all have our unique personality print, so to speak. But so does that mean we have a label? Or, or are, we, are most of us normal? Is that what the label would be? So there's no such thing as normal. And so, for example, there's, there's a, a, a very well-known personality test um, called the MMPI that we can give people. And no matter what, you're going to have a particular profile on that. You might be higher on psychopathic tendencies, which means like rule breaking or a nonconformist. You know, you might be lower on depression, higher on anxiety, whatever it may be. We all fall somewhere on a dimension on all of these traits, which taken to the extreme, you would get a clinical diagnosis. What's so, your label? Oh, me? I think I was a, on the MMPI, you have to be labeled something. So I think I was pretty moderate on psychopathic, deviant, and hysterical. <laughs> so glad. Which was like rule breaking <laughs> and, and being emotional. But it was all, it was within the normal range. But what I'm saying is that even when you're in the normal range, you're going to be higher on certain things than others, you know. So um, there's no such thing as to not have any psychological profile. And then there's also an, a hidden measure in there for people who are malingering. You can either be faking good or faking bad. You know, faking bad to get out of something like going to the army or faking good to, you know, not go to jail. And there's inherent measures where we can pick that out in people as well. You can detect malingering? Yes. Yeah, yeah. But I thought that was a problem with a psychopath, that we can, that, that a psychopath can fake Emotions. Yeah, there's certain, and this, this MMPI test, they usually give it a lot to people who are in jail or trying to get out on parole because it's very hard to cheat that. So in everyday life, when you're dealing with a psychopath, we're not giving them these very sophisticated psychological tests to see what, you know, what's really going on. But when you have a criminal who's trying to get out of jail and you want to see, are they really, you know, just faking good? Are they actually, have they changed internally? There are certain tests that can pick that out. Yeah. When we have a spare hour, will you give me this test? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've given it to a couple of people. But you have to be willing to be okay with what we find. Okay. Oh, right. <laughs> you know, I've given it to, just as a side note, to um, some celebrities, like people in the limelight. And, and, and faking good seems to be something that is coming out. So, you know, putting on this air because you want to answer in a socially appropriate way because you have, you know, a public image. It's interesting. Hannibal Lecter is fiction, thank God, and for three movies, Hannibal Lecter gleefully eats people with no backstory. Then Harris writes Hannibal Rising, giving Lecter a traumatic backstory that involves Nazis and Soviets. Do serial killers in real life often have these traumatic backstories, these histories? Not always. You know, not everybody with these different psychiatric disorders like borderline personality disorder or um, antisocial personality disorder have had something traumatic happen to them. You know, as I said, you can be born with certain tendencies and maybe stress can bring them out, but it doesn't have to be a major stressor. It could be a minor stressor. Um, the other thing is that people want to think that it's not deterministic, you know, like, oh, there's a reason for this craziness. I like, as an audience, we, we take comfort in that, right? Right. You don't want to think that someone's randomly diabolical. Right. But if you really think about it, whether it's an environmental cause that's got them that way, or it's a genetic cause, in both cases, it is sort of deterministic. I mean, if you're either born with this genetic predisposition or, you know, you had a horrible trauma that occurred, they're both reasons. But if somebody is facing you with a gun and is about to kill you, is it really going to matter to you, you know, they're going to kill you. Their what mom died. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, and so at the end of the day, it's really what is the final behavior and how can we modify that? And like, as you know, as we talked about, many people have trauma, but they don't all turn out to, you know, be cannibals at the end of the day. Does the absence of a backstory make Hannibal Lecter more terrifying? Well, I think without the backstory, it makes him more intriguing. You know, there's this sort of what actually, how did he get there? And, you know, once you throw in the backstory, maybe we empathize with him more. But, um, you know, the open ended, a lot of people like when we look at Durst, even, for example, you know, how did he become that way? What's the situation? We're very curious on what yeah. got these people the way. But would they have gotten that way if they had a whole different backstory? You know, does the backstory really matter or would you know anything that had occurred in their life cause them to but be I've that way? I've learned from you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Heather Berlin, that we crave completion, right? We mm -hmm. play, we crave closure. And so I think when when, we, when it, it it is a mystery to us those those of us who don't kill people, right? Why would somebody do that? And so yeah. we crave a backstory, right? Just to just to put our brain at rest. Oh, so that's why. Right. Why do you think we like Hannibal Lecter? Or if 
or if we don't like him, we kind of relish watching monsters like him. And I, and I will say that, that his character in particular has so many fascinating little Phillips, right? The, his like, mm -hmm. he's, he's brilliant in his accent and his cooking. I mean, I think he's yes. anomalously um, kind of um, f fun. Mm -hmm. But what do you think about our, our compulsion to watch these kind of monsters? Well, our fascination, I mean, just psychopaths in general, they tend to be very charming. They tend to be very intelligent. They're, they're, they're so adept at manipulating people that we're fascinated by it. Because in a way, they're cheating the system. You know, when I talked about that, there's about 3% of the population who has this sort of adaptive where they're sort of born with this tendency. That's now, a lot. It's a lot. I'm kind of scared it's by a lot. And they're not all, out of 100? They're, they're, yeah, they're not all killers. You know, there could be people who are on Wall Street who are, you know, you can get an adaptive advantage by not feeling empathy for people because you make, normally we're risk averse. They make better decisions in certain aspects that when, when you don't allow emotion to get in the way. So in a sense, They've been kept around the ge the genetic sort of pool, so to speak. Now, if, if I'm everyone, sorry, I'm going to interrupt. Is yeah. it is uh, that three yeah. percent? Is it um, heavily weighted towards one sex or the other, or n no? So what's interesting is that people diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder they tend to be men. It's about seventy percent men. People with borderline personality disorder it's about seventy five percent women. But what we're finding is that. They both have a lot of similarities in terms of, for example, impulsivity and in terms of prefrontal cortex function. And one theory is that it's the same underlying brain dysfunction interacting with male and female traits with different hormones that can express themselves in different ways. So a borderline woman might be impulsive and can't control her emotions and she harms herself. It's like internalizing and tends to be more female, although there are male borderlines. And people with antisocial personality disorder tend to act out, tend to harm others, and it tends to be more diagnosed in men. But that's the end point. So people are diagnosing at the end point behavior rather than taking a step back and looking at the real underlying symptomology, which there could be a lot of similarities. But the truth is, in terms of acting out, nine out of 10 murders uh, are done by men. So murder is a really male dominant uh, profession. But is someone who, but someone who murders somebody isn't necessarily a psychopath. Right. right? Yes. So what's, what's the difference? So a person with antisocial personality disorder, and we would put psychopath under that, although there's some subtleties between sociopath and psychopath, but in formal diagnosis, it's all called antisocial personality disorder. They have a pervasive, like meaning it goes throughout their lifetime of, of impulsivity, not caring about the rules, not really caring about other people's emotions, you know, acting out. Um, so it's a pervasive uh, sort of pattern of, of behavior. Whereas people can commit murder, commit murder for many different reasons. Um, people in the throes of passion, they do it for love, they do it for greed, you know, they do it to get an advantage. And it doesn't mean that they are a, a, a psychopath. People in, in, you know, caveman times, and, and we've, you know, for many years, there was about one third of deaths were from murder. Watch Game of Thrones. Okay, There's Game like, of Thrones. It's like it's people get murdered every all day. All the time. Stannis Baratheon, he murders his daughter. He burns her at the stake. It was so disturbing. Now you think, is he a psychopath? No, he was very... Um, logical in his analysis oh, that this is, but this is old testament this is abraham and isaac yeah yeah and also and, and also the the saving the mass you know he really thought that he was going to be saving his army and all the and you know and for this one sacrifice right. and so there's this this we all could commit murder if it came down to it and it's really it comes down to a moral dilemma you know there's this so interesting because i know you're going to agree with me like right. i would commit murder for my children so i said this but i wouldn't is... murder my children for something else right? right exactly and and so but then the question is is that ethical um so you know we we had this trolley experiment you know there's people laying on the train right. tracks and the train's coming and you could switch the lever and it doesn't kill that person, but then it kills, you know. Everybody in the trolley right. dies, right. So I said, what, you know, if there's one person and five people in the trolley, what would you do? You would save the five people. But what if that one person is your daughter? I said I would kill 5,000 people. Now that's horribly unethical. But You're our emotions, person. yeah, I know. I know, but I could never kill my child. So, so it's an, actually, it's, it's not logical. It's, you know, it's not really ethical. I mean, why should 5,000 people die for one? But my emotional attachment to my daughter makes me not want to kill. Now a psychopath would make the logical decision and say, you know what, I don't have any attachment, you know, either way. 
and actually, like numer numer numerically, become a hero. Yeah. 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 But I mean, so, but the point is that not all people, I mean, murder is something that was very common in humans for a very long time. I and mean, people even say in psychologists that we all, it's normal to even have murderous impulses, you know, to have murderous thoughts. We've all maybe have at some point thought about killing somebody, but whether we actually do it or not, that's where we have the control. Well, over the, the thousands of years, our t testosterone levels have also declined. And they've said that correlates with with living in a less less murderous times. We, we think everything's so dangerous now, but like you said, people were like killing each other all the time way back when. Yeah, and there's this interesting chart you can see about the murder rate. So you have it, it's kind of like, when you look at male and female, it's kind of like flat line. Then all of a sudden, and how it correlates with age, at around age 13 or so, it spikes in just the men. Murder rate goes up, just men. Women have like a tiny little. And then, and then it gradually kind of goes down as you age, as testosterone declines. declines. So it's a really strong link between testosterone and murder. And that is about all we have time for. Thank you for letting me pummel you with questions. <laughs> Don't forget to check us out on the web at cuny.tv under the Science tab, where you'll find past shows, additional content, and a link to our app.